Or five o'clock, having arrived, I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Directors for Valley Cities Water District. And we'll start with the roll call. Oh, that's the pledge, not the roll. Yes, let's start with the pledge. And I think that I'm going to the pledge. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the roll call. Director Alicard? Here. Here. Present. Here. Uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Presentations. Look at this. See something nice and shiny in our fine friend's hands? Yes. Thank you, President Hernandez. Uh, I'm just here real briefly to share that the district won a California Association of Public Information Officials EPIC Award, EPIC meaning excellence in public information and communications for our employee spotlight videos. This was kind of a seed of an idea that Rondi had had about capturing our senior employees, uh, their careers, uh, what job functions they do, uh, almost uh, to, sh to uh, mirror our job shadow program where you can go out and follow a fellow employee and see what they do. Well, this is kind of a video version of that that they can, they can look at much, much quicker. And uh, Alicia kind of took this whole project and nurtured it and turned it into, so far, she's got four completed, fifth one in process. And I think you're all aware that Don won that uh, Supervisor yep. of the Year Award that was, that was basically developed from the spotlight, the employee spotlight, where she kind of repurposed the video and produced it. So she in turn repurposed these four videos and submitted it to uh, uh, the Capio. And uh, she went up last week. There was 10 in our category that we had submitted. There were four that were the finalists. And uh, we, we were victorious. So just a chance to share this award with all of you. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Chris, is there a way uh, for the general public to see these spotlights? Uh, can we hook them somehow to our televised meetings uh, along with other things we were going to be putting on there, water conservation ideas that come from the County Water Authority, from other agencies? Is there a way to spotlight so the general public can see uh, and our spotlighting of our employees? I think that's and a for great that fact, idea. Is there a way the board can see it? Yeah, that's a great idea. In fact, the... Uh, Do we have enough... The RV is going to take that upgrade of $2 million for us to see it here. Yeah, maybe so, well, especially with the sound and so forth. But I, I, could, I, could, I could probably, uh, probably what would be best is they are pretty long, they're pretty extensive, but maybe give you a synopsized version that you could watch here in the boardroom would be ideal. But then also we could actually post them. And, and I believe Don's video was actually uh, posted and is available for people to see. Posted but not televised. Not televised, but I will look into the televised. See, I, I would not know how to look up the post personally, and know what a lot of people. Um, but if it was televised, not that a lot of people watch our, but they, people still go through channels. I like the idea. I'll check into that. Yeah. Thank well, you. Very good. Thanks. Well, thank you, sir. Congratulations. Congratulations good job. to yeah. your all, staff as well you. and all the good work. Yeah, Alicia really, really was yeah. the lead on this and, and really nurtured it. Thank you so yeah. much. Use it. Use it. Uh, item next is uh, public comment, and I have uh, one speaker. Uh, uh, who would this gentleman be? Oh, that would be Mike. <laughs> Mike Hunsaker, 115 Equestrian Court. I was able to review the uh, video of the recent uh, Master Water Plan workshop. That was all of number six to view it. As to uh, my absence, my wife was seriously ill, and for a week there was particularly touch and go. I do consider these things extremely important, and I would have not missed it for something of that magnitude. I have many questions and issues 
with the master water plan and many of them will be brought up during the remarks period. I do have a couple of issues I think should be addressed. One is mobile home parks. That zoning has been eliminated and this is one area which is particularly sensitive to costs and uh, it is a life-threatening situation to have major utility costs. The county has got a 211 line where they monitor citizen inquiries. The first concern is to search for help for affordable housing at 41% of the calls. The number two is utilities, which is at 39%, because a $5 increase in utilities translates into a decision between food and life-saving drugs. I think that they deserve and should receive uh, consideration in light of the fact that they are some of the most frugal users of water and utilities in our neighborhood. Uh, I do have a question as far as some of the mobile home parks are going from master meters to individual meters. I was working with one mobile home park and I was told that the BWD expected to have new hookup fees for each individual uh, unit that was hooked up to an individual meter. And I was wondering how the mobile home parks now converting are paying facility fees. Uh, a major issue with the Master Water Plan as it's all set up now is it's based on no density bonuses and no added building that the Sacramento is uh, threatening to impose upon us. <clears throat> if any of this thing occur, and especially density bonuses, there should be some sort of impact fees to take care of the differences. And lastly, quickly, uh, I would hope that in the future that uh, any presentations that come out be posted rather than having to request them and that uh, workshops be done in a reasonable hour in the evening as of the criticality of this per previous promises by the council. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Consent calendar 1.1. Um, yes? No. no. Uh, all matters uh, listed under the consent calendar will be voted on one, message, one motion, unless someone wishes to pull an item. Anybody care to pull an item? I have a question on 1.5, but I'll ask that question after. It's not going to change my approval. Okay. Very good. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent Move calendar. Approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And a question, sir. Yeah, I would like to ask staff, do we differentiate in any way um, a townhome from a condo from an apartment? Is there any differential to us in the way we look at our water fees and, or is it all the same, multi-unit? I'm going to ask James or Rob to address that for you. Thank you very much, sir. Director Martin. Uh, how we look at it from a condo versus an apartment, we don't have a difference between the two as far as our uh, water capacity fees are concerned. Or a townhome? Uh, yeah, a townhome being if it's like a multifamily block, then no, we treat it the same there as a condo or an apartment. Okay, well, I'm asking specifically of item 1.5. Mm -hmm. Is the, because they're calling it a townhome, is it differentiated in any way from an apartment or a condo? Gotcha. So the townhome, this is just part of the title of, of the, the property here. These are technically not townhomes. These, this staff report for 1.5 technically deals with three single family residences. Uh, they're, not, they're not townhomes. They're just calling it townhomes in the project title. The developer is that is. There's another component to this project that the board will be seeing at a future meeting that does have townhomes in it, I believe. 
yeah, there are there are multifamily units here on another portion, uh, like the general manager did state. Okay, so the ones we're approving right now are single family residences. That's correct. Yeah, this is this is the uh, construction how, agreement for how are we that extension. here at the water uh, authority. How do we differentiate between a townhome, a condo, and a single family residence and an apartment? How okay. Do you differentiate. So, single family residence is a, a, a typical detached residence there. So, they're typically charged one EDU water and sewer here. Multifamily, uh, they're not charged that. They're charged at a rate, I believe it's uh, nine tenths of an EDU. Depending on density there. Uh, and typically, uh, multifamily uh, would be master metered. Uh, because that's typically uh, less expensive uh, for that developer. Right. So, so basically, it's detached. So there's no common walls whatsoever. That be correct? Basically yes, for for single, single family, family residences. No yes. common walls anywhere, including garages. Uh, garages adjoining two different lots. No, these will these will each be on their own. Uh, assessor's parcel number. On their own lot, okay. Correct. So there are four, well, it doesn't matter, they could be rented or for sale, okay. I just right. want to know what the differential is because it's pretty specifically put in here, townhomes. And last time I saw this was many years ago, it was all apartments. That was many years ago, different different concept, I'm sure. No, no, I think I understand the confusion here and that's, it, it has to do with the title of the development here. They're calling these town homes which is not the definition of a town home. These are definitely single family residences on this part. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very good, moving on to uh, action items 2.1, the uh, certified public accountant firm audit contract. All right, the, the California government code does require that the district prepare an annual audit. Um, our previous firm, their contract expired. Uh, they completed the last year's audit and their, their contract ran out. So uh, staff did uh, issue a request for proposals for a new audit firm. Uh, we did receive seven proposals. Uh, the two highest firms were interviewed on March 26th. Staff did meet with the finance committee uh, and discuss the project. And the joint recommendation is that the district award a contract to Davis Farr certified public accountants to do our next at least three audits. The contract will be structured for three years with two one-year extensions permissible. Um, and the fiscal impact would be $72,650 over the three-year term, which is actually $12,200 less than our previous uh, firm that did our audit, so, that, so that's good news as well. And tonight we do have Jennifer Farr from, um, from Davis Farr in the audience if you have any questions. Otherwise, the recommendation is to authorize the general manager to enter into the agreement. Yes. We did come to our committee and we concurred and we wanted to uh, thank Wes and the entire staff for bringing something in, much less than we paid before for it. Um, that's quite a savings to us, and I uh, really appreciate staff's hard work in making that happen. Would we like to hear from the uh, young lady? I just had one quick oh, yes. question. We, it's a, so I, if I understand it correctly, it's a, <clears throat> a three-year contract yes, with two opportunities to extend. Right. Each of those comes before the board, and we decide if we want to extend or go for another RFP. Is that... Yeah, the option would be to, to end it after three years or to extend it for one year and then maybe one year after that. Okay. That's at the, at the district's sole discretion. It's nice to see it saving money and thank you to the committee and to the staff and to us. Well, you've Welcome. come all this way. Please come up and say hello. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Good evening, President and Directors. My name is Jennifer Farr. I'm one of the founding partners of Davis Farr and our firm is excited to be your new auditor and really looking forward to getting to know you all and doing a great job for you. Thank you Thank for you. coming. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Very you. good. All right. Good to approve. Second. Uh, moved in a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very nice. Thank you very much. 2.2 Construction Contract Award of Operations Building Locker Room Expansione. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, President Hernandez and fellow board members. So 
Uh, item today is to uh, discuss the construction contract award for the operations uh, locker room expansion. Uh, as you may recall, about this time last year, uh, the board had an opportunity to tour the facilities, and I think everyone was in agreement that uh, the existing space was too, mo too small for the existing staff, uh, let alone any, any future growth. And even though Mr. Pedrazzi is not here, he would probably agree with me that the operations staff using that space are, um, well, they're not the smallest people. <laughs> so, uh, but he's not here, so he can't come. Um, uh, so, with that project, we knew there was a need uh, to expand the locker room. We did put together a design to expand it, uh, about 787 square feet, and that project was bid last June. That price tag came in at about $613,000 and change. Uh, the decision from the board was uh, to look for ways to reduce that cost to the budget. So, we did meet with the Engineering and Equipment Committee meeting, and we uh, came up with some strategies to reduce those costs. Uh, we discussed that with the architect and we put together two options, a smaller, uh, what we call our base bid, our 522 square foot uh, locker room expansion, which is just lockers. And then we had a second, an alternative, uh, an alternate option to keep the same footprint as the original design, 782, three square feet, which had lockers, showers, and sinks. Uh, but with both of those options, we made changes to reduce the cost. So we changed the external wall system from a tilt-up to a standard stuck in, stucco and plaster uh, stud wall. We reduced the height from 19 to 14 feet. Uh, we removed the epoxy coating on the concrete floor. Uh, we removed the tile from the walls. Uh, we eliminated all the TI improvements to the existing spaces, and among other things, to reduce those costs. Uh, we kept the uh, engineering Equipment Committee meeting appraised uh, of that progress through that design. We bid that project out this March. March uh, 27th, we did receive three bids for this project. Crew Builders was the, the low bid at uh, $352,000 uh, for the base bid, the smaller project, and $452,000 for the larger project. However, there was a, some irregularities, some minor irregularities uh, in that bid. And uh, I can go into more detail uh, afterwards if you want. But one of them was that their price for the for the larger alternate uh, bid was actually four hundred thirty-three thousand dollars. So uh, I just wanted to kind of make you aware of that. So once we had those bids, oh, we did meet with the committee again to evaluate those bids, come up with the recommendation. Um, your board packet has some breakdown of comparisons of the two projects, uh, cost per square foot. But in that committee meeting, we kind of discussed basically uh, what's the best bang for our buck for the district in, in, in the expansion. And the decision was to move forward um, with um, the alternate bid, that price of $433,000 uh, for the construction. With the changes that we made uh, back last July, uh, we do realize of almost $180,000 savings in the construction cost from that previous design to what you have uh, here before you today. So that's a, that's a good thing. So with um, the recommendation, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of share with you the fiscal impact. With that price, that $433,000, you're looking at a surplus for the budget of uh, almost $46,000. So the recommendation uh, in front of you today is to waive the irregularities as I've described them and, and are in your board packet, to authorize the general manager to execute a contract with crew builders um, for uh, a construction contract for that $433,425 subject to the provisions of the contract, and I can answer uh, any questions you have. Yes. Just, just out of curiosity, or are we familiar with crew builders in any way, shape? Or no, what? you no. know, uh, and as you know, we don't do a, a lot of vertical no. uh, construction, so uh, no, we're, we don't have any familiarity with them. Um, uh, we did obviously review their. Um, the references, and I can tell you that the references came in very well. Um, I can't remember the agency right now, but they, uh, they expressed um, a great pleasure in working with them um, and their attention to detail. Um, if you go on their website, they have uh, a lot of uh, letters of testimonials and, and, and a lot of gallery of projects they worked on. Uh, it looks like they focus more on tentative improvement projects. Uh, which usually means they're more attentive to the details and the finished product, um, and that's a good thing for us. Um, so yeah, it, we're, you uh, felt like staff did due diligence 
and making the recommendation as well as the committee. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and council was involved uh, in the process of evaluating okay. the bid, and they were involved in the process as well. Um, yes. Move for approval. I have a few questions to ask. Sure. A few comments. First of all, thank you uh, very much to the committee for working on this. I know you gave it a lot of time and a lot of thought, and I know staff did as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm just more old school, I'm sorry, and I look at this and I go, well, it's kind of like you're saying, making it larger costs more, but it's a bigger bang for our buck. It's like, say, if I go in to buy a hat and they're 50 bucks, or I can buy two for 75, buying two is a better deal, but I can't wear two hats at once. Kind of reminds me of that, that thinking. It's like, well, bigger bang, do you need it? That was the question. Sure. When we did the tour, um, of the facility, and, and don't get me wrong, if we need it, I, we need to get it for the guys at, at the time I said it, and now I say it too, then we need to make it happen. My question is on price and how much we're doing. It's not that they don't need another shower, I'm sure they do. Although with our tour, were you with us on our tour? Yes, I was. On our tour, I noticed that one of the showers was full of supplies. That would have been very hard for them to use. True. So that would be a reason why you would need another shower. You need a supply room probably more, and we have a big one of those out there somewhere called the warehouse. Uh, but there were supplies loaded up in there. I also noticed that our women's locker room, of which I understand we have three women yes. that work in, in the, that, those kind of things that need yes. a shower, dramatically oversized for the use it gets. Um, and my question at that time is, is today is, TIs to me are a much simpler improvement to do knock out a wall and move it a little bit and add the guys and make it an L shape and give them more room. Other than if you need another shower, you gotta add a shower to it. I understand that. So my, my thought is, and the, the last part, which there again, being a small business person, when I used to do TIs in my business, I never counted my time and labor. And I noticed we have $177,000 to staff and overhead to get this job done, but are charging ourselves to do our own work. I, I find that interesting, but uh, it's a different business. Uh, so, but therefore, I, I come up with the conclusion that the expense, either one, is more than I would think TIs should be, uh, and, and I just don't see our ratepayers having to pay that much for pretty basic TIs that I think we've made more extravagant without the necessity. But I could be wrong, I don't stay on this. And reading this report, and I read it four different times, and it might be my thick skull, but it's very confusing, back and forth, back and forth, but I haven't been intimately involved as our, as, our, as our board members have been, and I appreciate everything they've done and staff has done. I just have a problem with that much money to add uh, very little, uh, I think. And another question is, how many lockers do we end up with, with either one of these scenarios? How many lockers are there? Uh, as far as the number of lockers, mm -hmm. um, if we were to um, Add them up. use the alternate design, we would end up with 77. If we went the smaller footprint, we would have 68 lockers in total. At that's the end women's of the day. and men's. No, oh, sorry, no, that's just the men's. How many do we have in women? I, I know that the women's what? locker space is about 100 square feet. I don't know actually how many actual lockers are in that space. I think we heard 14. Maybe I, I know there, I, and I'm assuming there are half lockers as well. And, and in this project, yeah. we are going from half lockers to full lockers uh, to give the, 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 the workers just more space. And I don't know if you recall from the tour, um, but usually their boots are up on the hood and their stuff kind of piled around because that half locker just, as you can imagine, with the extra clothes and the gear that they have, doesn't really come in. It. So, anyways. Does that kind of answer your question? So we're lockers? replacing the lockers yes. with larger lockers, which makes sense. Yeah, and the There's men's, the men's locker sense. space right now is about the same as the women's. It's about 100 square feet. Um, and you're right, there is there is less uh, women using that facility. So to answer a few of your questions, um, as far as a TI and the women's locker room, we did look at, and in fact, uh, the committee put forth a sort of a concept of taking that over um, and creating another locker room for the women. And you ended, in that concept, you ended up creating a larger space for the women, just the function of arranging it. 
a, a, a stall and a, and a sink and a, and a and locker space. It ended up just being more space for the women than what they actually have now. Um, and, and then if you kind of look at that and say, well, okay, what if we don't have facilities for women in that space and they use another building and we just take that over for the men? And we did look at that option as well. Um, the configuration, when you start taking out stalls and sinks out of that and, and trying to arrange uh, lockers, their locker room is much more narrow uh, than the men's side. And so you end up, it's, it's just not an efficient, it's certainly, it's certainly possible. There's, there's 20 ways of solving this problem, as, as you can imagine. Um, it just didn't seem effective and functional. Um, and, and the committee looked at that with us. I believe they were in agreement uh, with that. Well, as much as I have questions on it, I haven't been intimately involved because I'm not on that committee, so I have to trust our committee and our staff, which uh, I'm going to do, but I, I hopefully the committee comes up with <coughs> going at the smaller bid amount rather than the larger one. James, did you have a comment? I saw you raise yeah. your hand there. And just to clarify, the first part, one of the things that uh, when we went, took the tour, the reason why there was uh, uh, gear, it was actually personal protective gear that was put into the shower is because they didn't have any place to put it. So it wasn't stored, it's because they don't have the locker room uh, for the, uh, for the uh, laundered um, uniforms and the pers personal protective equipment. So they have a, a little, that, that rail, that carton, they're putting it in the shower to get it out of the way and then they bring it out of the shower if they need to use the shower. So it wasn't, uh, that was the reason why that was in the shower because we didn't have proper facilities to put their equipment and gear and also all the uh, uniforms. And uh, just to kind of reiterate what Jason was talking about, the women's locker room was, I don't remember the exact square footage, but around 450 square feet. Yep, yep, and it's kind of a, a long and narrow. And we looked at uh, from the original recommendation from Director Hernandez of, from the Engineering Equipment Committee, converting that into a men's pure locker room. And we, together, we could maybe get an initial 20 lockers in there. Uh, and once you, once you remove the uh, existing lockers, and I forgot how many they have, uh, but they're half lockers, but now to make them full-size lockers, you end up with the, almost the exact same amount of lockers that you do today, which is, would be still around 40 and change lockers. I don't remember the exact number. So it really wasn't any growth, and then you still have to provide the women with a facility. So the, the logic after the discussion with the committee was, if we're going to provide a facility that's gonna be more efficient, there's, it doesn't make sense to provide a larger facility for the women, because the women's facility, we tried to make it work for the men's by taking out walls and, and putting more lockers in there. It's just too small and too narrow. Uh, and you'd have to build another bathroom anyway. It'd be cheaper to build just a 500 chain square foot locker room, which could hold you know, 60 something lockers. And then, of course, we have the alternative bid per committee direction to see what would the full price be if we wanted to do the whole thing for, you know, the future foreseeable build out. So, and those are, those are kind of how we arrived through the process, working through the committee of those two bids. But we did evaluate that, and we earnestly tried to look at seeing how we could utilize the existing space, uh, even go into the, uh, the, we just completed ten improvements to put uh, offices on the other side of the women's locker room, to see if there's any additional space there. And either way, you're still building a facility, and if you're gonna build something, it would be larger than the existing women's locker room. So it just didn't make practical sense from a common sense standpoint, and also from a dollar standpoint. Thank you, and thank you for ahead. all of your hard work. Sorry. Yes, your manager? I, I don't know, Jen. I was just gonna add two things. One, I heard a reference to a high cost for just tenant improvements. I think this is certainly beyond tenant improvements. We're actually constructing an extension. To me, tenant improvements is working within the footprint of the existing structure. So just to clarify that. And the other is I would encourage the board members not to focus on the number of lockers. It's really about space. Because if you look in the existing locker room, there's, there's a lot of lockers, but there's very little space between them. And you can't get a couple of big fellas in, in there and effectively change and put on personal protective equipment. So the, the real focus is to get enough space, and that space allows us to put more lockers in, but the number of lockers wasn't the driver for the project. Director Evans? Well, I didn't know if the committee had a comment to make before I made my comment. Did, was, were you planning to speak? Go ahead, Director. I had a specific question, but oh. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I was on the tour, and I um, 
thought it was an incredibly tight space for the men to be in. Um, I know women tend to take want more room, so it doesn't surprise me ours is a slightly for the bigger for the women, but I don't think it was built on purpose that way. I think we're trying to anticipate where the industry is going in the future, so that we only have three women is not the fault of the um, locker room. It's you know the fault of the women at this point to be employed. Um, as far as the locker goes, um, I'm impressed very much with the committee and the staff work with what you've done to bring the costs down. And I do understand it was about the space. And thank you for explaining about the locker room and the um, shower use of it as a storage place. Because that's what I noticed most of all. There was not much room to move around. So I think we're doing, um, I think you've done a really great job. I'd really like to hear if you, if the committee has any comments to make and come up with their decision to support the um, larger room. And I don't think our industry is such that our employee number is going to go down. And I doubt the size of humans is going to get much smaller either. So um, I'd rather, since those employees are using it every morning and every night, day in and out, sometimes in the middle of the night, I just feel it's important we give them the space they need. So I appreciate what we've done. Um, I think it was great we took, took down the tilt up walls and lowered them a little bit and things like that. You did a really good job on that, in my opinion. So I'm very supportive of it, obviously. Here you Yeah, I, just, I had a, maybe you can address the bid irregularity on the, on the roof. I, I'm, sure. I'm a little bit concerned with that. And, you say that uh, the contractor was agreeable to accept the tabulated bid amount for the for the lower amount, but you know that's almost nineteen thousand dollars, and that's probably half or more of his profit. How? I mean, I, I just don't want to start out with an unhappy contractor. You yeah. never want to do that in these kind of relationships. I mean, is what's your feeling on that? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's always a, a hesitation. Um, District Engineer Gumpel had, had a very long, lengthy conversation with them last Friday, and they did feel that, um, uh, as you may know, that uh, they don't like to hammer their subs to try to make up some of that cost, but um, that their initial take was that they thought they could absorb that. Um, their explanation for why the error occurred made very uh, made logical sense yeah, to us I, in, in the I context that. of the other bids, so it, it made sense. Um, and you're, you're right, it, it's always hesitant to go to a contractor and say, hey, are you ready, right out of the, you're not even out of the gate, are you ready to take that hit? Um, and they, they are willing to do it. So that does put a little bit more of the onus on us to make sure that that doesn't get made up in, the, in change orders, as, as I'm sure you're aware that that does happen in the industry. Um, but we're, we're both, us and them, uh, eyes open, uh, moving forward. So we don't see that as an obstacle. And we did have extensive conversation with our legal counsel to figure out how to resolve that bit irregularity. Oh, very good. Yep. I do have two items. One, just to let you know that the committee, we really went through this with a fine tooth comb, looking at both just the base bid and then the uh, expanded bid. And, and the point was that just that uh, for the extra dollars, it probably made sense. The other item, and Director Martin touched on it a bit, and I did mention this to the general manager when I looked at it, and maybe it's just numbers, but um, it looks like we're double dipping. In our budget, we have salaries and benefits, and all of our staff is involved in that. And then for our capital projects, then we have staff involvement with the multiplier. Well, as Director Martin mentioned, our staff is already here, uh, A, and if, and if it's the allocation, just to allocate, okay, instead of working on plan check, if you will, you're over there monitoring the, the uh, construction. But, and, and I'd like a little more explanation of that, and, and maybe, as I say, maybe it's just the numbers and the allocations, and it's all, at the end, if we save money, we just put it in the next year's capital budget, and on we go. Um, or do we need to make a policy change where we don't double dip, which in this case would save us more than $100,000 on the capital budget program? Yeah, I'll, 
probably ask Wes to step in, but I, I believe this probably has to do with the fact that when we assign uh, the staff cost to a project, whether it's a pipeline or in this case a facility, we're able to capitalize those cats, those costs, and so the, the assets for the district are, are true asset values, the cost to truly install that pipeline or facility or what, whatever. So I don't know from a financial standpoint, as far as gov mm -hmm. uh, government gap, uh, no, we're kind yeah, of let me, let the me, accountant world. Be, uh, before yeah. Wes starts to address it, let me, let me say a few things. One is, um, when I hear the term double dipping, it almost sounds like we're taking money in one way and we're taking in more money somewhere else. We're certainly not doing that. The money comes in for the staff costs, comes in through the budgetary process. This is more of an accounting mechanism to make sure that we track the project, the costs associated with this project, and we move the money from the operating budget where it's budgeted for the personnel and kind of move it over into the capital side. So as, as um, Mr. Hubbard said, we can track the cost of that project. It's not so important in this project, but there are examples where you'd want to do that. For example, if we had a grant funded project or we had a project where maybe we were cost sharing with another agency, you'd certainly want to demonstrate the cost of that project so you can get reimbursement. Oh, yeah. But you don't want to have two different uh, methods of accounting, whether it's a, a project you get reimbursement or not. You have one, one set of accounting, and that's where I'll turn it over to Wes where he can talk about the, the standards that apply there. So yeah, he said it perfectly. It's actually job cost. Could you so use the mic for us, please? Sorry, Thank yes. you. <clears throat> So you're not double dipping. What's happening is you're just moving the money from the operating to the cost of the project. It's called job costing. It's actually a generally accepted accounting principle. That's why we've actually assigned an overhead rate and we have that in Ordinance 206. So it just puts the appropriate cost of the project. So it's moved from operating. We have a direct move into the cost of the project. So if we didn't have it on the project, it'd be in the operating cost. So it's in one place or the other, not double dipped. Uh, and GAP, generally accepted accounting principles, requires us to do that. That way we get the, the right cost of the project, the appropriate cost, and it can be depreciated over the life of that asset. So it's matched with the appropriate time period of benefit of that asset, and that's why we do it. Okay, Director Martin. I have to go on that line. This was my largest uh, complaint when I was the numbers. Again, looking at it, this is not a water project. So I don't think we have that many staff that needs to be involved in unless they want to be. Um, we hired someone to design it. We're hiring someone to build it. <coughs> not a water project, not a sewer project. Why is our staff involved? Just because they're gonna look at it every once in a while? So the amount of staff time, I'll redirect that to, to Jason um, so he can talk about Yeah, it. let me know the amount of staff time we could, because maybe we didn't need the consultant. Maybe we didn't need the designer, because you guys could have done I don't know. But it seems to me that we are double dipping because we're getting many people paid for the same job. Well, uh, we did pay the, uh, the consultant, the architect, uh, and they're about $89,000, which I think is, is a line item here. Yeah, it is, 89000 And that's, uh, to date, I think they've all, of that $89,000, um, there's about 10000 of that of their cost will be in the construction phase. So part so that that eighty nine thousand is was to design it and then also to help us uh, manage it in construction. That's awesome to help wait to help us manage. Sure. Why do we have any management responsibilities whatsoever? Well, we still this is still our facility. We still we don't turn all responsibility for any project over one hundred percent to our consultants. We will always give them direction, we will review those plans, and, and that's where the staff costs are. Through the design phase, it was an, almost entirely myself and, and my assistant reviewing those plans, checking those details, making sure that we are getting uh, what we paid for. So that, that's happening during the design portion of the project. Okay, let me just, if I'm, and I don't wanna, I like comparing things because it makes it simple for me. So pardon my making it too simplistic. I'm a homeowner, I'm going to build a home. I hire an architect, I hire a builder. They build the home, I write them a check. I'm not involved, then I walk around once in a while and say, well, I like this tile here instead of there. But it's the same thing, I don't understand where our expertise as building contractors comes into this equation. Because I don't think we have any. 
Well, we do have expertise in, in building, certainly. In fact, I was a contractor for 10 years. So on, when I look at the plans, I definitely look well, at it from a, is this buildable? Are there issues with how walls are connected, anchorage, um, uh, a lot of those factors. Um, and then we also, our responsibility is to put together a bid package. So we are reviewing and, and editing those technical specifications, uh, the bid documents, uh, the insurance requirements, all those things are reviewed by staff to uh, make sure they, they meet uh, the satisfaction. Isn't that what the design consultant does? Am I missing something what, here? Let, let me come to the aid of our staff because it, it is it, it, absolute common practice to have a manager managing the project and overseeing the contractor, even though the contractor may have a superintendent and project managers and all the other staff. It is absolutely essential that we or somebody, whether it's our staff or we hire a construction manager, review what's going on because there's going to be weekly meetings, there's going to be uh, what they call RFIs, requests for information, ASIs, answer of information, uh, payroll, all the documentation. There's, there is a great deal of, of stuff, and I know because I'm a construction manager on that dang uh, uh, firing uh, range, and uh, there's just a lot of stuff, and, and it, it's essential, and we, we just can't allow the contractor to do it without any without any oversight and that little piddly amount that the architect has is primarily maybe shows up for a construction meeting or answers a, a question but uh, traditionally that's 25 percent of the fee so uh, we should get a little benefit there and let me just say i wasn't impugning your integrity about oh, being in the building business no it wasn't I, i'm assuming that that's not what you do here so your background might be you know thousands of years and i don't know You'd be surprised what we do, what we get involved in. <laughs> well, I, I know. I'm, I'm just Everything. saying. I, I just, I, I've only been involved in one project in town. It was a million and a half dollar building. And when we met for our weekly meetings, there was the architect, there was the builder, and uh, there was myself as a board member and the CEO of the company that was being built. And I didn't see us paying the CEO or me anything. So that, that's my experience. It, that's, it, the boys, it, that's the Boys and Girls Club. Yeah. That's my experience. We didn't have this extra cost that we that you guys had. If I could show you the, the amount of red line, uh, 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 red lines that were sent back to the architect uh, from our staff, um, you, you would see the extensive nature that we really get into the details with them to make sure that those okay. plans are, are, are good, not only from just the layout and, and the connections and that all the pieces. And as for a building, you know, there's just so many trades that are affected that they all match <coughs> the structural plans, match the plumbing plans, meet, meet, match the site plans. Um, it's, it's, it's quite extensive. Well, one of the things that, I'm, that maybe what James is chomping at the bit to, to do is to... Lead eyes on the back. What we try to do is make sure that we get the value for what we paid for. We want to make sure we're getting a good Everybody quality does. product. Yeah. But it's our our, uh, our motivations are different than the contractors, and we want to make sure we're looking out for the ratepayers' best interests. And one of the things we do really really well here at Biocidos is keep our change orders to a very low amount. So the involvement early on through the plan check process and the permitting and the review of the project, all the way through inspection and final close out of the project. If you do that well from an agency perspective, you keep your change order costs very low. Mm -hmm. And that's where you really get hit hard. When you're in the middle of a construction project and you didn't really look into something well, the contractor has you at a disadvantage uh, because you don't have any competitive nature for any change orders. So you want to make sure you eliminate those. And that's one of the things that Jason and James's team does. They try to make sure that the project's put out with the least chance for change orders and poor construction quality out in the field to make sure the ratepayers are getting what they, what they deserve. James, did you have a comment? Uh, Jason, you could probably just address this. So uh, just to clarify, uh, Director Martin, that $177,000, which includes staff time and overhead, a significant amount of that is already spent because one of the side effects of redesigning the job really two and a half to three times because we designed the job and we designed another job and then we re redesigned the original job is, is in the effort. So that's not all on construction effort moving yeah. forward. Jason, do you know the staff time yeah. already spent? What, what, what we've actually spent today is about 118,000 of that 177. So, so there's 50,000 and change that we're anticipating to spend. And we're conservative in that numbers for a reason. 
typically we come in under that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I can come back and say, okay, the surplus was, we projected 46. Hopefully that, that number is more like 66, 76. And I'm, I'm gonna ask Wes to help me out here, but I think of that number that Jason just talked about was 120,000 roughly that we spent to date. Yeah, we spent to date, yes. Only about a third of that is actually direct labor costs out of the engineering group. The multiplier yes. for the overhead is about two times. So for every dollar that James's group spends, we spend two dollars supporting the organization. All the administrative folks, the building, keeping the lights on, all that stuff, that's the overhead rate. And that's about 2.2. 2.2 So for every mm -hmm. dollar we spend through engineering, we spend 2.2 dollars supporting that. So you can almost divide all those labor numbers by three, and that'll tell you about what the costs are directly to the project, and the rest is overhead, which is a board-approved overhead rate that we charged all of our projects. Yeah. Okay. And in the and in the redesign efforts, just so you know, um, we spent about um, about thirty-five thousand. Again, divided by three of of labor costs was directly uh, in that redesign effort. So. So one, other, one other question Go ahead. to continue. So even with all of our staff all totally on top of this thing, 24-7, uh, you've got a 10% in there for change orders that you're anticipating we're going to get. That's, that's per our ordinance, um, as we have to figure that on, on all construction projects, I believe under a million dollars. Ordinance uh, 146, I believe, requires us to, to, to build that in. Now, that's a 10% max. Our averages are usually around one to three percent, and that's part of what uh, the general manager was saying why we, why we put that extra. We don't want to spend ten percent, but uh, the ordinance uh, forces us to put it in there uh, for budgetary reasons. Just you know, all these charges I'm looking at, I understand when we're building a water main, when we're dealing a sewer, but we're doing a TI to our building. I, I see those as different animals. Why, why is it different? I'm, I'm trying to understand the difference. Because Still an asset to the district. Yeah. Yeah. It's an internal cost as far as I'm concerned, uh, not an external cost. I mean, it's, we're building it for the betterment of our employees, which they should have, and I agree with it. If they need it, they should have it. But why are we charging ourselves all these price, all these charges? I don't understand that. Well, but but that, that's just me. Yes. Yeah, as a comment to that, I would just say it reflects the true cost of these facilities to the rate payer, in, including the overhead rate. I mean, and, and this overhead rate of 2.2, by the way, is, is pretty reasonable. I, I yeah. retired from a district where it was, it was, it was four times for non-engineering staff, and it was five times for engineering staff. So, yeah. So I mean, this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Actually, if I could, sorry to interrupt. Um, so the cost is actually just being moved from operations to the cost of the project. And by doing that, by moving that cost, we're actually allocating over the life of the asset. So we're, we're saving the cost for this year, or the year of the, that we're moving the cost, into the year of the asset. So we're actually saving the ratepayers money because we're allocating it over the benefit of the asset. Because you're, you're, and so it's not additional cost, it's just being moved. So we're taking out of operations, so you reduce this year's cost, you put it into the cost of the asset. If it's got a 10 year life, it's depreciated over 10 years, so you divide the cost by 10 years and, and therefore reduce the cost of the ratepayers. Thank you, Wes. Very good. I'd like to move for approval. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the construction, uh, 2.3, uh, the construction uh, contract award for the boardroom audiovisual and light upgrade project. Are you still with us? I'm still with you. Apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, the next project is the construction contract award for the boardroom audiovisual and, and lighting upgrade project. So um, as you know, the equipment and the audiovisual equipment for this room was installed in with the, with the original building, 1997. Uh, you, you may or may not know that uh, much of the equipment is unsupported, and that's probably why. I know that's why that screen is no longer functioning because when things break, we actually cannot replace them. Those, the, that equipment, those parts are just no longer available, which um, with technology is, is, is not uh, uncommon. So 
Um, part of the, uh, the district strategic plan is for organizational improvement, and one of that, uh, part of that is to improve the equipment here in this boardroom and throughout uh, the district's conference rooms and training rooms. So the board uh, approved a budget in fiscal year 15-16 of uh, $500,000 to make those improvements. And then I believe in two, uh, 2015, I wasn't involved in this workshop, but there was a workshop held to figure out, okay, what were those improvements gonna be? There was staff input. Uh, we had a, uh, a consultant on board. I believe there was input uh, from the board as to what uh, improvements were gonna be made. And in that workshop time frame, the decision was, well, to reduce costs, can we defer the improvements to the boardroom as sort of a phase two, if you will, and, and let's initially just make the improvements to the training room and six other conference rooms and meeting rooms throughout the district uh, buildings. So that decision was made and we moved forward with that phase one project, if you will. That upgrade to the training room and those other six rooms was completed in September 2016. So what you have in front of you today is sort of that phase two project. Now we're gonna, as, as directed by the board, defer this project to this fiscal year. Now we're tackling it. So that project uh, for the upgrade of this uh, boardroom, uh, your board packet has a list of those improvements. Uh, I did invite uh, Vance Brashear from Adivri, they're our consultant uh, on this project and have been our consultant uh, since the beginning. And uh, I was hoping he could come up and maybe clarify some of, uh, of what those improvements in this room will be. And, and just so that you're aware, once again, there is a base bid of what we're going to install, what we propose to install. And then there's some additive alternate uh, options available to the board uh, to pick and choose, if you will. So Vance, if you don't mind uh, running through some of these okay. and, and putting it in layman's terms. So uh, the the systems would be... I'm sorry, I missed your name. My name is Vance Pershears. Thank you. Uh, company name is Idebri Consulting. I got that. Just didn't okay. catch your name. Um, so the, uh, it's a pretty comprehensive rework of the audiovisual systems here in the, in the space. <coughs> uh, it's going to consist of video displays. Uh, there will be a, uh, a new uh, PA system, microphone system, new video displays on the front. There will be two... Yes, I'm no. sorry, Matt. Don't mean to interrupt you, but can you go down the list as we have it here? Okay. Because I do have questions about certain Sh items. Okay, sure. So the first item is two 48 uh, or 82 inch LCD monitors located on the front wall. So these would be on the front wall displays. We used to have tape up there. Which is that? Really. Those are the areas that we're thinking about where the tape was. Yep. Yeah, that was a mock up to yeah. see what size the screens would be. All right. Those those are primarily for you know people out here in the. Uh, in the audience. Uh, two portable 82 inch LCD monitors to be located left and right sides of the room. So this one, this monitor rolls in from engineering uh, every time, but there would be two monitors that are similar to that that would be on stands and they would be in this type of location. They could be moved moved around and used for different purposes. Is that an 82 inch that monitor? That is not, it's slightly smaller. Okay. Maybe 76. Something okay, like something. all right, very good. Uh huh. Question. And that, that's part of our EOC? This is in our engineering room, so it's used for customers when they come up and they have questions about uh, anything regarding their parcels or whatever. And then we do uh, bring it into the EOC if, if necessary. But it's primarily used for customer service in the engineering calendar. And I just want to mention, we haven't seen the EOC equipment since it's been installed. We should, we There's should a chance a that maybe the board could go in there sometime sure. to see what's been already done. Mm -hmm. Is there a question? Any other questions? Yes, continue. Okay. All right, then there's going to be 21 and a half inch LCD monitors that are going to be for the, the board members and the staff that are going to replace the monitors that are here right now. So how big are these? Those are 18 plus or minus. So a lot bigger or a little bit? Bigger? They're going to be a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. Yeah. So in that, those are going to be, have, you know, whatever's displayed on, on the, uh, the main screens as well. So the, the audience will be able to see this up front on the side screens, and then you guys will have the okay. opportunity to see those as well. Um, we have a, uh, <coughs> and there's going to be, those monitors are going to be, again, for staff 
and for um, for the uh, Diane for the control. There's going to be a two camera system that's <coughs> going to be for web streaming and recording. And what the, <coughs> right now, so that under the base bed, there's two cameras. There's going to be one on the front wall, so that when somebody comes up to speak, it can switch the the streaming or the recording can switch and see that person. And then there's going to be a, a center camera on the back wall. One second. Just before the cameras came up, you talked about um, the five monitors for the us and the five for executive staff. But then it said there's three 21.5 LCD monitors at the AV control position. Yeah, that's over here where Diane sits. Okay, so there's actually 13 monitors total. Is right. that how I read that? And those will be rec for recording and dedicating for the local presentation computers. What does that mean? So when somebody comes in with a PowerPoint, and uh, because what she needs to do is control the systems and then be able to see what's on the monitor and see also what's coming from the computer, it's there, there's the monitors for all that. You can tell I'm really up on this, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> OK. Uh, yes, let me ask a question. Just by looking over there, uh, I don't see how you get five 21-inch screens in that smaller space. Like, do you put them up high? It's well, there's going to be, um, no, she's going to have a couple, one of her screens will be a touch screen, but they aren't going to be stacked up high. No. There'll be three. In this there's three. There's three there. Space. Two over there. And those monitors are going to control the cameras? Well, she'll have a touch screen. So the camera control is automatic. It's, a, it's an automated system. Um, a lot of boards have, they bring in uh, operators and people to, to produce their, their board meetings. The right. system has been designed to, to be an automatic, an automated system, where depending on what microphone is active, the cameras will be programmed to switch to that to the camera that's. Do, yeah. Did staff request? I'm just trying to figure out one of the cameras, the one you're going to have up front, taking. Uh, um, that makes me very unnerved because you can get people saying almost anything there, and you have no control over it if it's a live stream. We have no control over it right. whatsoever. You it's, can be streaming things that you really don't want streamed. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's standard practice in the industry in, in boardrooms, conference rooms, city council chambers to have a uh, recording of the, you know, if nothing else for, you know, maybe for security purposes. Well, recording, anti security. I, I think you were speaking about live stream. Are we going to be live streaming or are we going to be recording and then sending it to Palomar? Where yeah, so that's up to you. That's your guys' decision. Okay. Maybe something we want to discuss later. Yeah. Okay. Continue. I'm sorry. So there's the two cameras in the base bid. Um, there, we're going to replace the ceiling speakers that are out here. There are going to be, um, uh, as you know, it's pretty dark up here when you stand back and look, look up here. So the video is is very dark. Uh, a, I'm I'm sorry. Again, Big no, my, no I don't know enough about this. We currently have two speakers. And we're going to have eight speakers. Actually, more. You have two here. There's a bunch out here in the ceiling for two. the for the people to be able to hear. Six. Oh, there's one there, one there. Six. Out okay. There. So they have to be replaced because they don't work very well. Um, that it's kind of at the end of life, and they're not, you know, they're not that expensive. So in order to, I mean, we don't want to put in a new system and have pieces of it fail because of their existing okay. equipment. Um, we have uh, a plan to put in uh, track lighting up here in the front, and that track lighting will illuminate the, the board so that, again, the quality of the video will be improved. And there will be LED at Yes. Good. So they're little small, small little fixtures. Just let me ask a question. I, I, the seeing dice is lit up before for the TV cameras. Uh, my understanding is, and, and I don't know, but if you have lighting from below, it does much wonders for the people on camera, so they don't have their makeup done. <laughs> Are you gonna do anything with the lighting in the front of this um, to have it come from below, which really versus getting the Frankenstein effect? Yeah, no, um, we, we've looked at that for different projects. The, uh, the challenge with that is as you move papers and stuff in front of it, it causes shadows and things like that, and there's, a, there's more glare if it's coming from, 
from below and in front okay. of you right. than, it, than there is if it's coming from up above. Okay. Um, we've also got in the in the systems. There's going to be a portable uh, staff table over here that'll connect. There are going to be some connectors in the in the uh, in the wall here. That'll have two computers and also so there's two workstations there. That there'll be a new podium that will be mounted over here on this side. So it's kind of a little different configuration from what you guys have now. And those are movable. You can swap them, you can take them out, they'll be portable, you can reconfigure the room as you want to. Um, and we're gonna abandon the, this spot right here. Uh, we have, we have uh, AV equipment including video recording system and related equipment. So uh, uh, switching, routing, so that the, whatever signal you want to have can be routed to the different displays. Um, support infrastructure, including conduit wiring and uh, mounting of the displays. And then we have, so that's what's in the base bid right now. And then we have some add alternates that we broke out, uh, depending on if you, if you guys want to add those or not. Yes. Could you at this point, um, if we were to just do the base things, in what ways do we improve the current system just with the base? Because I don't know, I mean, besides that we're bringing up speed and we can replace parts and it's available, but I mean, are we, um, I mean, I understand we're giving the view to the audience, but I don't understand, is the audio going to be much better? A lot better because I notice on the audios when I've listened to them, it's very difficult. Um, there's a lot that's very difficult, and I'm so I'm just what does that part do? It sounds essential, but I just don't understand the differences. I'm so sorry to be no, no, no worries. Um, but, so um, the 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 displays obviously are going to be a big improvement. Uh -huh. um, right now, if you're sitting in the front, you have to look to the side to see what's on the display. Right. Um, there'll be four displays total instead of just the one functioning display. So that's, that part is pretty self-explanatory. The lighting system is going to provide a much better video image of what is recorded along with new, uh, the new cameras. So the new cameras and the, new, and the lighting system will give you, uh, you know, decent quality video. And the camera's a much higher upgrade, I assume, than the one we have at the back. Correct. Because you said it can move and... It'll pan tilt, and, yeah, and again, that's the difference with between the two cameras in the base bid and the two additional cameras. There's a similar system at the at this county operations center. At the uh, there's a conference center building. If you've been at the COC, the, they have a conference center in there. That the um, I think it's the um, county planning department meets at, and some of the other uh, agencies meet there. And it's a four camera system like we've designed for this one and it's automated as well. And what it does is as you, the new microphones will actually be, you'll have a little, uh, a little console in, in front of you and it'll have a push to talk button. So the mics will be, your mics will be off. You'll have to activate the mics when you want to speak, but the mic will be closer to you. So you'll have, it'll be better uh, quality in, into the microphone so the recordings will sound better. Um, but what it does is when you push the button to speak, the cameras, for example, um, will be programmed so that when you, when you want to speak, you push the button. One of the cameras in the back will, will pan over and zoom into a fixed shot and the, and the switcher will switch to that shot. So it, it more, the, the video follows the audio so that when somebody starts talking, then you can see that person talking. And so the quality of the video of the, of the product that you're going to post on, online or, or you know, record or whatever, it's going to be a better quality. Uh, so it's more production. similar to what, like watching the county supervisors or something Correct. where it's moving on. Yeah. And it would also capture the speaker at the podium? Correct. Okay. And the idea is if you watch other, if you watch <coughs> city council meetings, other board meetings, uh, those types of things. <coughs> the, the idea is when somebody speaks, you kind of want to see them. Right. And so right now, I'm up here talking. 
the only thing that's being recorded is the back of my head. So, um, Amen. And, and <laughs> you know, that may be all you want to see. So, um, and again, it, it, the, the programming can be such that if somebody, when somebody activates their mic, they're recognized to speak, the cameras turn, you know, pan, tilt, zoom in, and then you can get a good shot of it. And you feel much, when you're watching it, then you see actually what's going on. And it's really a, a standard right. TV production. So that's thing. already what we're doing with the first group. And that helped me a lot. Yeah. Director Evans, one thing I didn't hear Vance say is that they will be voting stations. So oh, at your yeah. spot, you'll actually push to vote instead of verbal votes. It'll actually be a push button system. So the president can call for a vote and you can punch in your vote. Is that an option like at the Water Authority? I know we sometimes we have to vote with button and sometimes we don't. I don't know their rules for, for voting and when they use the machines. And Only when they, when they absolutely need a roll call. Yeah, yeah and it's I'm a, just wondering. There's a legal implication to that. Um, again, some organizations, we've worked with a lot of different city councils and different uh, water board, things like that. Um, Again, some require legally a uh, an anonymous vote, and then they post it afterwards so that the whatever the vote is is unduly influenced by one or more people. That's what you're here. Yes, Director Martin. My, my experience has been when you've had to take a vote in like Sandag or those larger ones, it's when it's a weighted vote that you have to actually yeah. press, so the computer can uh, do the weighting option yeah. automatically, so you know whether it passes or fails, no matter who votes. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, <laughs> no, never mind. I do have a question, I, and and I'm I'm just I'm surprised <laughs> with all the darn screens we're talking about. Two back here, two over there, uh, and I know the option is to put another one out there, uh, which I wouldn't agree to at all. But do we really need that many screens in this size room? to facilitate, uh, particularly if we move the podium over there, uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering perhaps what you could tell me, what does an 82 inch LDC monitor cost? Um, I don't have a line item cost on that, but it's um, the, the reason that we picked the screens that we did and the, the quantity that we did is because if you're sitting in the back of the room According to, to accepted industry practices, the, the screens that are up here in the front are too small. So they do not meet the, the accepted Infocom industry standard for screen size, especially if you're looking at maps or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's just an industry, you know, uh, industry practice that we have to really design to that standard. So the reason we put the other monitors uh, on carts is so that the people in the back can see those. We looked at hanging stuff from the ceiling and decided that was not a good option. So. And also, Director Hernandez, having those screens uh, gives you a little bit of flexibility. Kind of, kind of what Vance was saying with the tables, you've got the flexibility to kind of move the configuration. I know there's other meetings that are held here uh, for different purposes, and so you would have some flexibility uh, for those types of, types of situations. So that's just sort of an added benefit, uh, as well as meeting the industry standards like you mentioned. Okay. Yes, Director Murphy. I, I, my own personal opinion is we're overbuilding uh, by quite a substantial amount of money, but I'd like to see this go back to the committee to look at uh, a little finer detail. I mean, there's things you need to think about uh, when you're putting in a camera system uh, and having extra cameras, having to zoom on people. Uh, you have to remember you're opening an open podium for someone who wants to be on television to stand there for an hour and talk. Uh, you have to remember a lot of things go into this on our side, and although you say it's standard practices, I know there's people that just use a back, a back camera, one camera system, as we are using. Maybe it's a better quality, but as we use it, because most people listen, they're not there to see what you color eyeshadow I have on, or what pearls Mike is wearing. You know, I mean, uh, it gets a little too, uh, a little too overblown. And as far as I'm concerned. This system has worked fine. I don't see a problem with it, uh, with the exception of that screen going down, which, by the way, went down after they started talking to you because we had these two wall things up here while that screen was still working. But I see another 78-inch screen on this side 
takes care of the problem. I don't see the big problem in why we're doing this, to be honest with you. The EOC, I could see because you had to communicate with other people. Here, we're communicating with just the general public, and it goes to Palomar, or we use it internally. Uh, we don't have, I haven't heard many complaints from people about not being able to see screens when they're here. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen any. Uh, I mean, so I'm just saying, we're fixing a problem that's not a real problem. It's a lot of money. And uh, I, I'm trying to always think about ratepayers. Uh, what are they getting out of this? I don't see a lot, to be honest with you. I just don't see a lot. EOC, we did. I understand it. In an emergency, that's very well needed. This, it's worked fine for six years I've been here. I guess I would just remind the board that this was a this is the continuation of a project that was proposed four years ago, three four years ago. So this isn't something that came up new. Yes. This isn't something that staff thought up recently. It's just because of budget considerations and rate impacts. It was the board directed staff to defer this. So now we're bringing it back. And it's, I wasn't here before, and I don't know if Jason was, but and I don't know to what extent the board was involved in vetting out what this project should be. But I can tell you, this is not a great room for making presentations. It's, it's right. just not. Uh, the screens in the back would be very helpful for anybody because it's not just board meetings. We do have other meetings, staff meetings in here at times. We, uh, other groups like to use it. We have the Water Academy. And it's very difficult for those folks to follow the bouncing ball, see what's going on. And the screens on the side are helpful, but it's hard to pay attention to the speaker and be looking to the side constantly what the screen is showing. Well. <clears throat> Um, okay, Jim. There's been a, a, a request that it go back to the engineering committee. Uh, and personally, I, I don't think that's a problem for me because I do know, A, our system is old. It needs to be upgraded in portions. B, the sound is pathetic. I'm deaf. I can't hear a thing. Uh, and there, you get the, the low talkers that come up there, and uh, that's, that's not good. But I am concerned that... <laughs> And jokingly, I said to the manager, it looks like a sports bar with all the damn screens we have. So uh, looking at that, and that's why perhaps uh, a review of the engineering committee with a, a cost breakdown, maybe there is a little bit of savings that can be accomplished uh, so that we can feel comfortable that we are getting the best bang for our buck. So um, I would like also to see it go back to the engineering committee. Yes, Director Evans? Well, I personally would prefer that it came back to the whole board and oh. not just engineering. I think that you've got some interesting questions that have come from the other board members, and I don't feel that this discussion should really take up this gentleman's time right now. If we're not certain what we're wanting to be presented, I don't know how we legally where we are, <laughs> the bidding and stuff. But I would prefer maybe we have an actual separate meeting to understand, because for me, I think this room is very, very poor for presentations. I have been in the back and I can barely see any of these. They're very small and they're tight. I don't think the sound is good. I feel I have listened to the tapes and they are awful. You can't hear the people that are talking. You um, hear all kinds, you can't tell. And you know, you, you learn so much. Um, if our point is to make it available to the public, the public learns a lot by looking at who's speaking and how they're saying it. And I think that's really important. So I'm all for the movable cameras, and I think it's up to us to control the speakers as best we can and ourselves. So I'm all for, for doing something, but I think it should be done with a reasonable, as reasonably as we can. Um, I don't know that this is unreasonable. There's a couple of boardrooms. I've actually been to other boardrooms. I'd like to go back and maybe take a look at them in session. So just make up to see what other I like. But um, uh, yes. I would prefer it wasn't just the, the mm -hmm. if it's right. okay with you. I would like to make a motion that we send this back to the committee for their review and their recommendation. I'll second that. Direct, uh, manager. If I could just uh, address one of the things Director Evans brought up was about the, the bid itself. So, and Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way this was bid, it was all kind of a lump sum. It's all put together. So. If we brought it back to the committee, it's going to be very difficult for the committee to figure out, oh, if we remove this and this, it would be this price. My experience with these types of things, if you start to remove things, you're, for every dollar you remove, you're only saving 50 cents. Yeah. So it's not the best way to do it. And if you <coughs> wanted to go through this process, happy to, to work with the board on that. 
we probably have to go all the way back to the drawing board, redesign the project, re-advertise it, and get the bids again. Yeah, and I will just, you know, when you look at the prices we got, and, and, and you may feel that this is an expensive project, but you, you may notice that the prices are all clustered really close together, which is indicative of you're getting a real good price um, in, in the context of, of, of the economy and the market right here, right now. We can certainly bring it back and, and look at it, but this project definitely addresses the concerns that you have brought up yourselves, the, the, the issues with the audio, the issues with uh, meeting standards and uh, having the flexibility and, and the presentation to to the public. Whether that's value to the board or not, that's certainly up to you and we can take it to committee or, or workshop or however you want to uh, rework it if, if, if that's the direction. Uh, there was motion on the floor. I didn't hear a second, so yes, I think. There was a second. What? Oh, that's right. There was. Oh, okay. There's a motion on the floor to take it back to the committee, and um, all in favor say aye. 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 Oh. Before you take that back, before you take that action, could I add one thing? Yeah. So maybe a question to Jason and uh, the the attorney and I were talking. So how good are the bids? How long are the goods bid bids good for? Because we may need to take an action tonight to reject the bids that we uh -huh. received, yeah, 30. as opposed to processing and getting back yep. if the bids are still good for that period of time. Yeah. So I think that'd be a good piece of information. I'd have to double check, but my, my recollection from our old specs was the bids are good for 60 days from original bid opening. When was, when was the bid opening? April 5th. April 5th. So any action, uh, and just aware, whether whether we go to committee redesign uh, from a staff point of view, that, that there's no resistance, there's no, it's, we want to get through the product. This is the boardroom for the board and for the public that we want you guys to be happy with. Uh, but just to be completely aware that the workshopping it, that's a, there's a good chance unless we really hustle that the bids will probably be null and void and it'll be a rebid process, whether it's the same job or a different job. If, if the job gets redesigned, it's a rebid process. Anyway, so. So. There's a motion and a second to take it back to the engineering committee. Yes, to, yep. Go ahead, more discussion. If, well, just before we make the vote, how, how much time has your committee spent on this? We have one meeting. Well, and we, did, we didn't have the bids. The bids had yeah, At the time. Meetings. And, and the, the, the breakdown is where I'd like to be directing staff to get. Having been in the business, providing a breakdown is pretty standard stuff. So then you can, and then the adjustment if necessary, is really a grocery list. So, um, so you're not comfortable with the way the bid is presented, or with no, uh, because it's a lump sum number. And again, I want to find out. In my opinion, I think there's too many screens. And if but if the screens are two or three thousand dollars, it won't make any difference because what well, the heck? You save three thousand dollars on a two hundred and plus dollar project, but then I would know that. So. Taking it back, we can get a meeting quite quickly and have this back uh, at the first meeting in May, for the 18th, it, it, if that works for everybody. Any further questions? Motion and, uh, and a second's on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Very good, we'll take it back to committee. And okay, one last question I ask? Yes. I don't see the overhead here. Uh, staff and overhead, yeah, if you look down, that's the, the 20,393. What page? Uh, 64. Maybe. Sorry, I don't have the... 54? 64. 64. 64. Yeah, so... If, uh, yeah. All right. So, I'll uh, direct staff to uh, set up an engineering committee for this, and uh, with that, uh, if you could have the contractor give us a cost breakdown, so that we can figure out where this is, we'll uh, have a better understanding. Thank you very much. Moving on. Can I ask? A yes, by all means. This would actually be a question, I think, of, of council. Since we're actually kind of reestablishing this, doesn't it seem appropriate to deny these and start over from scratch? I mean, we're asking. We've got a bid that we're asking someone put a lot of work into, which. But we haven't even defined what it is yet, and then we're asking them to do it in 30 days. Well, I guess from what I'm hearing, 
the bids are going to go back to the committee to review and assess and then come back with a recommendation because the committee hasn't had an opportunity to review the bids. I think at that point, depending on what the committee does, that would be your opportunity to take action on the on But the they bids. just stated you want breakouts and there breakout. aren't any breakouts. So are well, you're going to be stuck with whatever the contractor provided in the bid documents. Yeah. Yeah. And if there because are we no, haven't awarded a bid. Yes. No, I guess what I, so explain this to me. You have a bid, you've asked for a bid. You, what is it, the RFP or whatever you call it? We've give, asked for something and we've gotten three things and all three of them didn't do breakouts, I take it. At least the one we picked as the best didn't Jason, do breakouts. Watch, watch is that correct? Yeah, so, so they basically had their prices were broken up to three things, basically mobilization, all the audiovisual and all the lighting. So, so, all the so your concerns about breaking out. And what we typically do is once we award the contract to the contractor, then we require what's called a schedule of values, which breaks those items out. And that's really for billing purposes mm -hmm. and, and any changes in that kind of that, that kind of a nature. Um, I think we can contact them ahead of time and, and ask for that schedule of values. Um, they so are certainly not obligated to provide that. And well, so I, between now and the next meeting, would you be going back and asking the three bids to break down? Uh, just um, the just just the one bid. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to caution the board. We're, we're going in a diff, in a dangerous direction because if you start working with the apparent low bidder and change the project, mm -hmm. then the second and third low bidders are going to say, "Hey, wait a minute! If I had known you were going to eliminate that, I would have scheduled my bid differently, and I may have been the first the exactly. low bidder." Right. So we right. have to be very careful. I, I think it's an okay approach to have the engineering committee go ahead and take a look at the project. We can d dive as deep as we can. But we have to move forward cautiously from yes. that. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I understand that completely, that being in the game. So we'll mm -hmm. look at it. Yes. Yeah, and I think the other point is the schedule of values doesn't necessarily equate to if you deduct this, this is how much lower the contract's going to be. No, exactly. it doesn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think. And, and as you know, when you, when you do dedu deducts, as, as general manager said, you, you don't always get dollar for right. dollar. Right. Uh, yeah, right. Just keep that in mind. Yep. So. Well, if you want to alter the scope, you're going to have to rebid this work. Oh, yeah, no, that's so, right. There's no question right. Right. based on how it's structured. Yeah. Okay. Item 2.4, the Financial Institution Registry and Authorization. People's mm -hmm. names are changing. Wes, Wes is going to take that one. President Hernandez, members of the board. Okay, so with the recent retirements it's necessary for us to change the authorizations with our financial institutions um, and these resolutions don't there aren't any changes to the institutions themselves just the names that are authorized with those institutions some of the changes are due to retirements and, and other and basically it's mainly retirements and adding a few changes so no changes to the institutions um, with that you have four resolutions uh, one for LAFE which is the local agency investment fund the county investment pool, our general checking account, and the trust and custody account. Um, and staff recommends that you adopt the resolutions for changing the authorizations on those four institutions. Now, will that be one resolution or four? It's actually four. four. Okay. Very good question. Director? Yeah, that was going to be my question. Yeah. If there's four resolutions, does Diane have to give us the resolution numbers right. ahead of time? Mm -hmm. Or just. She's going to give them up as we go. Okay. I can I make, move for approval that we a vote? I move for approval on all four, and then we and then can we do it that way, or does it have to be I move on each one? You can make your motion in second. Okay. For, for the whole four, and then and take them one at a time. Each, Very, each I will do a roll call. Very good. All right. Then I move for approval of all four. There, and is there a second? I can, all right. Resolution. Yes. Point four out of the way. End of the action items. 
Item 3.1, the general manager's report. All right, just a couple quick ones. Uh, I, I neglected to say it earlier, but kudos to the team for that award that we received earlier. Yes. Really good job. So there's four employee spotlight uh, videos that were put together, and so four individual employees. And between the four of them, they have over 114 years of experience right here at the district. So that's a lot collectively for, mm -hmm. for four individuals. And uh, Alicia Yerman, she wasn't here tonight, but she's the one that puts that together, and she does a fantastic job on those things. So kudos to her and, and the team there. Uh, just a reminder that there's a finance committee meeting next Wednesday where we'll be continuing the discussion about the budget development. And the last thing is just a reminder that next Tuesday, April 24th, I believe it is, uh, Best Best in Krieger, they have that sponsored event up at the Nixon Library. Uh, board members are invited, but you do need to RSVP, and I hope it's not too late for that. So I'll make it work. Okay, he'll make it work. So if you haven't already RSVP'd, uh, please do so. It starts at 8 o'clock and goes till 5.30. May I ask? Uh, I, I know Director Martin and I are going. I don't know if anybody else is going from staff or anybody. I'll probably be attending. All right. I, I'm wondering, and just because I don't know, is there a chance that we can carpool in one of the staff vehicles, or is that not appropriate, or what? I, we can work out those details. Okay. Sure. All right. Very good. And that's all I had. Very fine. District Council. Uh, I guess, first of all, we are working into the process of acclimating. We've had meetings with the general manager and his management staff. Um, and last week went very well. We met with the engineering staff yesterday. Um, so we're getting up to speed on all the district stuff. Everything looks pretty good. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight, we have a public policies and ethics compliance group. And so I bought these uh, pocket guides, which they've put together on terms like economic interests, um, conflicts of interest, avoiding financials. They're just little quick pamphlets for everyone. I'll give those to Diane so she can share those with you. Um, they're helpful. They always got the asterisk, that the lawyer asterisk at the back, that it's just general advice. If you have a real problem, <laughs> call your lawyer. So thank you. Very good. Water Authority? Yes, we had our meeting early this month, and um, there's several things. First of all, though, is that a little bit of fluff. The Water Conservation Garden has hired a new uh, horticulturist, and it actually is the one who was at uh, Quell Gardens or San Diego Botanical, and he's very excited. In, a, in just his four months there, he's done amazing things, really changed. I mean, it's fabulous. And they're having a festival in a garden. They have a, a butterfly pavilion. So I'd just like to pass these out, take one, pass it on, bring a friend if you're I know it's a ways down there, but it is really worth it. He's um, just gone full tilt on the garden, so it looks really great. Um, then on uh, the meeting we had on uh, legislation in the Public Outreach Committee, I thought there were just a couple that I'd point out. One, they adopted a position of support on AB 3170 relating to um, sales tax exemption for water use efficiency products. And, it's, and it sounds like, oh, makes a lot of sense, but it's very specific. There will be three days at the end of March every year where they will exempt sales tax on any items having to do with water efficiency. And uh, I know the Water Authority has like saved a million gallons of water over a certain period of time with all the water efficiency. So this is a way of offering one more incentive. So we were excited about that, but it also is one of those incentives that you have to be sure you're paying attention <laughs> on those three days <coughs> in March. They also adopted a position of oppose on um, AB 831, which is relating to accessory dwelling units. And this has kind of been going in and out of discussion. I know the idea is to encourage dwelling accessory units, but in the process of trying to make it work, um, it was written so that it would prohibit uh, special districts and um, other organizations as such uh, to, um, what do I want to say, you wouldn't be able to do utility charges, cap capacity fees, connections, and things like that. And um, they went back and reworked it because nobody wanted to support it. And they did an, an agreement of a, um, a negotiated amendment where that would be withdrawn and limited. And then it's come back again, all of that's been removed. 
So we're opposing it again, hoping that they will put it in because the burden, they're assuming that there's no burden on water or utilities when you bring people in and use the water or the sewer or anything like that. And of course there is, there is. So we're opposing that unless they re-amend it. And then we spent a great deal of time on um, the water fix. Um, and we're having a full day workshop next Thursday on it again, on um, both, not the water fix, but more Metropolitan's approach to it and what the it means to us. And I'm gonna get confused if there's anything you wanna say about it because what was in open and what was in closed, we had a very nice open session on that discussion. Um, but I think the biggest fear in it is that Metropolitan approved it even though the biggest agencies there, San Diego, LA City, um, San Fernando Valley, and one more. Um, all opposed me. it, but the vote went in the way that Met wanted it, and now they're acting as if it, it doesn't impact us. But the truth of it is they haven't decided if that cost, which is in the 64, billion dollars well, it's about a 17 billion dollar project right yeah. they're taking on 60 64 percent of 64 percent could like go as high as 7 billion. there's 11 billion or something yeah it's a lot that? of money and what's interesting in the paperwork sometimes they'll be, you'll hear in the media that it's we're not we're using less and less water so we won't be paying for it but they haven't decided if it's going on transportation or if it's going to be like on ready to serve mm -hmm. and that's the big how do we because in some of the paperwork it states they're thinking transportation i mean it's written as it is and that would add twenty dollars a month to our people mm -hmm. if it goes on on a ready to serve it's within you know the 50 to a dollar 50 cents to a dollar so there's a lot of debate and a lot of surprise and a lot of upset going on with that but it was very very interesting um, they also had the um, I can't remember the name of it. it was 623 the tax on water yeah well you know where there's been a big push and we sent our 10,000 and I stood right up at our meeting and told them we did because we weren't on the list yeah. and I challenged Escondido to do the same and Vista and um, then the Water Authority also sent money and then they're out really pushing to get the public aware of how this water tax is really going to hurt everybody. Yeah. So that's the big items there. I think that covered it. And if you'd like to um, go online at the Water Conservation Garden also, there's a Save Water Pledge and you can win money and gifts and all sorts of good things if you are so inclined. Very good. That's it. In seeing the Wastewater Authority, we had our capital committee this morning, and we talked about our capital budget and the allocation to all the uh, agencies. <clears throat> Vista was uh, particularly uh, prickly about it, as traditionally they are, about in spending any monies and why and what for and how come. And uh, I think staff gave them a very good presentation to at least give them the information whether they're going to continue to have trouble with it will, will remain to be seen. But a uh, very good presentation, and uh, I know it's been delivered to the uh, managers already, so we'll uh, see what happens. Policy? Yeah, the Encina, with the Encina Policy and Finance Committee met April 10th. Uh, we reviewed a couple items. Uh, the first was a south we considered a south parcel temporary easement authorization. And that's on the 20-acre parcel that uh, Encina owns. It's uh, south of the plant on Avenue Encina. And uh, <clears throat> this temporary easement's for, uh, to support a Lucchetti Wastewater District uh, project. And the other item we reviewed was the FY 2019 proposed operating budget. That's it. Very good. A quick question? Yes. What, so what would this temporary easement from Lucadia, what would they be doing, storing pipes on it? Yeah, it's essentially a lay down area for construction operations. Thank you. And standing committees, finance? Uh, we had a finance committee meeting and the notes are in your packet. Very good. And the engineering committee, we've already had our meeting and it was pretty well discussed here today. Uh, 
Director's reports on meetings and conferences? Uh, yes, go ahead. That's okay, his hands up. All right. I attended uh, Cowa yesterday, as with the rest of the board did. I found it very interesting. I didn't know some of the benefits that uh, are offered through our vision care, which I think is uh, commendable. I think we have a great vision care. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, tomorrow I'm going to be using their uh, dental care. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But the vision care, I, I, I will be not, now going to get glasses. So it, it was a lot of information. I attended as well. Uh, good information and uh, pretty much what Hal said. I attended as well. I found it eye-opening. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, boy. I attended as well, and um, that was one of the presentations that was, was at last the last ACO conference at the JPIA portion, and um, it was really fun to see it again because you forget what some of the details are. And on these glasses, one of them, I think I'm one of the other meetings I reported that they have a great vision plan, but they're talking about the glasses that were be able to tell you how you're doing burning calories and if you're fit and all those things and we were, later some of us were saying what we need is glasses that have face recognition and then as you look across the room it will flash and you'll like you'll know everybody that <laughs> won't be looking for the tags I thought that was a great idea and um, yeah it was it was a good meeting. I like the new place oh yeah how do you guys feel yeah about I think it? so nice. food was good everything with the place is nice I think everything about that place is better than the, the last one. So oh, heavens, great yes. job done by everybody moving it there. Yeah, yeah. It was very good. I'm glad to hear that. And the distance isn't much of a bother. It's actually yeah. easier to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it All is pretty that. Carmel Mount yeah. quickly. Item four point one. Directors' comments. Future agenda items. Any? Um, I always seem like I had something in my. Seeing none. We're adjourned.